One, one last point about the exact conditions and the one on exchange. If you look at the atoms, neutral atoms, as Z gets larger, the lo local approximations become relatively more accurate. And part of it is satisfying that exact condition. So the exchange energy of an atom gets more, local approximation become the error becomes a smaller and smaller percentage as z goes to infinity. So if you don't satisfy that constraint, uh, I could just keep increasing z until your uh, method fails. Right? You'll, your error will get worse and worse if you don't satisfy that constraint. So uh, that's a pretty good point. Hmm? Z. Z is the charge, the the, the okay. nuclear charge. So if I if I look at uranium non-relativistically, um, the LDA error will be one or two percent for the exchange energy. But oh, yeah, you, know, you have to use the LDA formula with the four thirds and the linear scale. Okay, uh, density matrices and holes and things like that. Let me see. Is a better marker? Okay. Yeah. Let me use this one. So, so we heard a little bit this morning about the hole from John, and so we're going to do that in a lot more detail. Uh, because they, they give insight into the approximations for the energy. Uh, so I'll start with that and then I'll work my way toward some very simple things about static correlation. And then later in the next couple of days we're going to hear a lot more about something called static correlation. So, so we start... No, we don't. Uh, I made the good ones. Try this one. So start with the wave function. So start, yes. Start. Uh, so the n particle wave function, and uh, I'll put x1 up to xn. So this is a ground state wave function. And I'm using x, uh, let's say so j and b, uh, a combination of the uh, position and spin coordinates, just for uh, shorthand. And I'm going to define uh, this object, row 2 of r1 and r2 as n times n minus 1 times the sum over the first two spins and then summing over everything else and write it as r1 sigma 1 r2 sigma 2 I hope you can see that. Uh, so I square the many-body wave function. I integrate over all but the first two coordinates. I'm also going to spin some over the first coordinate, and I multiply by n times n minus 1. And this object is called the second order reduced diagonal then uh, spin sum density matrix. And I'll explain what it is. So second order, uh, meaning that we left two coordinates out. Reduced, meaning that we sort of integrated over the rest. Diagonal in the sense that we took the square of the wave function rather than 
psi star with one coordinate and a psi with a different coordinate, and obviously uh, we've summed over the spins. So this is an example of a reduced density matrix. You, you make a density, uh, density matrix by zipping up all the rest of the coordinates in the wave function. But for simplicity, we'll just call this the pair density. Otherwise, we'll be here all day as I use it over and over again. So what does it mean? Uh, so the pair density it's the problem gives you the pro it's the probability density. So this is the probability of finding an electron in D three R around R and the second electron in D3R prime around R prime. So if I look inside my system, I have a little ball D3R around R and a second direction R prime, uh, D3R prime. And this guy here is the probability of finding one electron inside this little volume and the second electron inside, inside that volume. That's, that's what it is. Uh, so given that it's a probability, it's always greater than or equal to zero. There's a, uh, sorry, greater than uh, or equal to zero everywhere. And then well, importantly, just an addition, you move from R2 to R prime, which is the same? Yes, it's the same object, I just, uh, uh, yeah. There are levy variables. Just to clarify, the density is the matrix, right? This is a number? It, it's, it's a, it's right, it's a number that's a function of these two, two, yeah, uh, coordinates. In a, in, if you use a basis set, then it will be a matrix. Right. Um, okay. So, uh, and we're going to, yes, an important normalization condition is that if we integrate over the second coordinate, this thing is going to be, if we just look at our definition here, right, and remember Mel's definition of the density this morning is just n minus 1 times n of r, right? If I integrate over one more, uh, one, one of these coordinates, right, it's, uh, it's just going to give me the density. That's what the density is. The density is the probability of the density times d3r is the probability of finding any electron in just one volume around R. So it, it contains the information about the density, but it contains more. It tells us about correlations within the system that you don't see just within the density. Pair correlations. Okay, so given that this is uh, probability, we can also write it as uh, oh, one, one other property more property is that it's symmetric. Row 2, obviously from its definition, equals row 2 R. Now we're going to sort of mess up the symmetry a little bit because I'm going to write this now as the density times something I'll call N2 of R, R prime. And this is then the conditional probability density. For finding an electron, let's say, near R prime, given an electron at R.
So this is because I've taken out the probability of finding an electron at R, this is this conditional probability density. If I know there's one at R, what are the chances of finding the second one? Now, if the electrons were truly uncorrelated, right, uh, in the mathematical sense, you would expect that the probability of finding the second electron would be n of r prime, right? If the, you know, if finding the two electrons were totally independent of each other, then it would be n of r prime. But it isn't. So we define uh, something we're going to call the whole probability density, which we're going to add to this. And we'll see that uh, overall it has a sort of negative effect. Uh, and this is the origin of the idea of the whole. Now, why does it have a ne negative effect? Well, once we've found one electron near R, there's one less electron to find in the system. Right? We know that uh, the number of remaining electrons is n minus 1. So this is going to subtract from the total probability density to remove one electron, because you found one already. So uh, if we look at, the, uh, look at this condition here, right? the fact that this guy integrates up to n minus 1, and we feed this in here, it tells us that this implies that the integral of this whole is equal to minus 1. Because when we, when we integrate this guy, he must integrate to n minus 1 particles when we integrate over r prime. But is it negative for any two r and n prime? No, it's just that it must integrate over r prime to minus 1, right? Uh, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, because to, to satisfy this condition here, since we've already pulled out of a factor of n of r and n2, so that means that n, let me, d3 r prime of n2 of r, r prime is n minus 1, right? From here, this guy integrates to n, so this guy must integrate to minus 1. Yeah. Good. Yep. Yeah. Uh, no, because it's a sum of these two pieces, right? Uh, but it is true that, we, uh, that n whole must be greater than or equal to minus n of r prime, right? That way, uh, n2 can never be negative. But you said that for a system without any correlations, the n2. I said if if the if the event of finding two electrons was uncorrelated in the mathematical sense, right? And it cannot be, because that would violate uh, conserving the number of particles, right? Exactly. So that's it. Yeah. Okay. So let's see, what does this thing look like, right? Uh, so let me draw a picture of it. So it's a fun the whole is a function of these two variables. And I'll just draw a sketch in one dimension. But there are pictures of these things. So 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 let's let's Assume so I'm in one dimension, I have some big density like neon or something. Maybe this integrates up to 10, right? Uh, 
So, the, so this would be n of x prime. I've plotted it as a function of a variable x prime. And now I choose a point x. And I ask, what is the probability? Uh, what is n2? Right. Uh, given that I'm at this point at x, what is n2 of x prime? And here I could use a second color. And I plot out n2 of x prime. And what I find is that it looks almost the same as n of x prime, except in the region of x. And in the region of x, there is a hole in my density. And this hole is, is that guy, and it integrates up the area in here. This is uh, that difference is n hole is n hole of r r prime. So it integrates to minus one. So what's happening is I look at some point in x, and instead of the probability of finding another electron being just my density. Near where I am, there's missing probability. And, 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 and it's exactly minus 1. And it's in the, typically, it's in the vicinity of x. Not always, as we'll see, but typically, it's in the vicinity of x. And this is called the whole. This is the spin. So we check the same spin that the whole digit goes zero. But I summed over spins, right? Uh, and actually, you've got to be a little bit careful about that because it's it's uh, these are probability densities, right? So, uh, but here we've spin summed, so, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that a little bit at the exchange level. Again. Okay, so uh, so the difference is that whole. Now, why why is this important? Well, uh, if we now look at the energy. We can actually get the electron elect if we know this object, we know the electron electron repulsion energy perfectly. Yeah? Yeah. To understand this question, we did we expect that it reduced to zero because of the only solution principle exactly this. We'll, we'll get to this. Okay, uh, so don't let me write, write this out and I'll show you what it is that happens. And that's, yeah, there's exchange and there's correlation, right? Uh, okay, so uh, let me just do the energy. So the electron electron repulsion, right, is a two body operator. Uh, let me write the psi a half. I don't want to write this in that. Does this work? Um, no, not. No, I'm still trying to I'll put it. First quantize. Oh, never mind. J. I'm sorry. There we go. Uh, right, this is the expectation value of the Coulomb operator. Because this is only two coordinates, when you feed in the wave function you find, you know, use the particle symmetry, this comes out to be just one half d3r, d3r prime, uh, row two, r, r prime. If you know the pair density, you know this guy exactly. Uh, just like if you know the density, uh, you know the one body potential energy exactly. Uh, but we feed in our definition of rho 2 in terms of the whole, and you see the first part is n of r times n of r prime, right? But if I put in n of r times n of r prime, what do I get? What do I get? Zero. No. 
If I replace this guy by the product of the densities, the hard trick, right? Thank you. Uh, so let me let me do that. N of R times N of R prime plus N whole. So this is U and something we'll call U X C, right? Uh, it's the exchange plus you, uh, well, let me write it uh, as EX plus UC, right? It's the potential contribution. It's VEE. -E. Uh, so EX plus UC is given by the whole. So this looks like the electrostatic self-energy of the density with its hole, right? That's not a self-energy because the two functions are different. But it looks like a hard tree energy except uh, that the second term here is the hole around the electron. Now one last piece of machinery is a piece that is going to come up. I think tomorrow in Mel's lecture, we'll be talking about the adiabatic connection formula. Uh, so you can do, uh, can do, do the uh, coupling constant trick. To write the, the regular exchange correlation energy. What we normally call the exchange correlation hole is a coupling constant average over this n hole. And, and for our purposes at the moment, it doesn't matter, but this is what's normally called the XC hole. And you just sort of integrate from uh, a, a coupling constant from 0 to 1 over the strength of the electron electron interaction, keeping the density fixed. Uh, but in essence, it looks very, very similar to this, this whole here. And this is the expression that John had just before lunch, uh, in terms of which he was trying to explain the, the LDA. Sorry. Yeah? Did the first one? No, that the second line. How did the second line come from? So because, so the, this is the many-body weight function, right? So when I take the expectation value of that weight function, uh, by using the symmetry of the wave function where I swap two coordinates and I just pick up a minus sign. So, so this integral would be over all n coordinates, right? But there's only two distinct ones in the operator. So all the different, there'll be many, many contributions, but they all collapse to exactly the same one, which is the guy inside here. You know what I mean? In any, in any one of these terms, right, say this is R3 and R4, then I can integrate over coordinates 1, 2, and anything past 4. So I integrate over all but two of the coordinates. All the, all the other integrals are trivial, they're just the squared wave function integrated. Yeah, I, and we, I understand why the other coordinates are not there. Yes, but I mean, that for, that. Quantity is specifically the probability of finding one at four pages. Okay, no, I'm not understanding. So, okay. <laughs> uh, well, that was because my explanation was perfect. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. So, this is going to be really, really important for understanding how density functionals work. At the moment, it's just formalism. Yeah. Can you explain again um, the difference between N hole and NXC of uh, the exchange correlation hole? No, because that's coming up in, in a subsequent lecture, right? Uh, but it, it's, it, I'll just say it's very mild. It's just, so the shape of this guy is, is almost identical to the shape of this guy. All the things I said are sort of true. Uh, there's just this one, you use the sort of Hellman-Feynman trick or Pauli's trick to uh, 
to the scuffing company, but what you're doing is this is potential energy only and you're folding in a piece of kinetic energy. And that's what this does. But for our purposes, it looks just about the same. Uh, okay. Okay. So, uh, yes, yeah, so now let's do the exchange part. Uh, so, and this comes to these questions about how does this thing look, right? So, uh, there we go. So, in the special case for exchange alone, so remember we said the exchange was defined by putting in the cone sham wave function here. Then you have no correlation, you just have exchange. So if you put that in, you, you put in the cone sham wave function, you get row 2 for uh, a Slater determinant. Uh, so if you insert phi instead of psi, uh, let's do this. Then row two, so we would call this R, R prime, let's call it X for exchange, is uh, N of R, N of R prime, minus row one, R, R prime squared. And this is the, uh, again, we'll put an X, this is the first order RDM, reduced density matrix, on phi. So it, it's, it's simply the first order density matrix, but it's not diagonal on the cone sham orbitals. And then we can show, if we feed this in, this means that the exchange row is equal to minus row 1 R, R prime squared divided by N of R. And this is a negative definite, this is less, this one does satisfy the condition that for every pair of points it's less than or equal to zero. Because it's minus the square divided by a positive quantity. So that's the exchange hole. And let's see how that looks in this picture, right? Uh, so, so if there was only exchange, if there wasn't any correlation, and if my 10 electrons all had the same spin, so that the Pauli exclusion principle applies to all of them, then this, this thing would dip to zero at this point x. Because, and, that, and that's what that means about the probability of, of, sort of coalescing two particles at the exchange level. It doesn't mean that it is zero, because there's also a correlation piece, and that can change that. Uh, and if, 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 say, this were like neon, so there would be five up electrons and five down electrons, then this thing will be exactly minus half the density at this point, because the exchange applies to the remaining electron, so uh, the same spin. So yes, so you can see, uh, so let's see, so we have a bunch of conditions, right, on the, uh, on this hole, uh, and the important ones are going to be, NX, is less than or equal to zero, and, it inter and because it's a single, because it, it has a, a wave function, this guy uses up the, the rule, and then NC of R and R prime uh, must integrate to zero. And in fact, let me do it for spin on polarized. For spin on polarized systems, 
you can show uh, nx of r and r prime is exactly minus the density divided by 2. Uh, sorry, nx of r and r. So this is something we call the on top hole. What is like which are uh, reduced density matrix. So 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 this is this this is the guy that you get from taking a wave function and integrating out all the coordinates but one, but in this case it's it's off diagonal, so you haven't set the R is equal on the two in the two wave functions. Okay. Yeah. But this time, did it take the end, the second condition? Uh, it's that the integral over nx integrates to minus zero. The one below it. Hmm? The one below it. Yeah. And this is that the correlation energy integral is zero. This is the correlation? Yes. So what that says is if I draw the exchange, and I need a blue color, and my picture, uh, and i got to get this right. So the exchange will look like this. And it might look like this. So the exchange hole is typically not as deep as the exchange correlation hole, but it extends out further. And it integrates to minus 1. So the difference between the green and the red is the correlation piece. And you can see it's negative here and positive there. And it integrates to zero. So the definition of n correlation is just the difference? It's just the difference between the real hole and the hole that you get when you try to when you make the hole from the cone sham wave function. So we see here the effect of correlation is to pull the hole in. It deepens the on top value, and because it's normalized to minus one, that means it pulls it in. But by pulling it in, it means that it is more localized in the region where you are, which means a local density approximation will give you a more accurate value. So you're going to hear a lot this week about cancellation of errors between exchange and correlation. What I just showed you was one very simple way to think about that cancellation of errors. The exchange correlation hole is more localized around the electron than the exchange hole is. That means when you do, you, if you follow the logic through, you find that the error in the exchange correlation energy in the local density approximation is smaller than it is for exchange by itself. And it's smaller than it is for correlation by itself. Because the two errors will tend to cancel each other. So this is a perfect example of two wrongs making a right. The sum is more. Yeah? Uh, can you comment about first order? Uh, first order it means that we have one variable. Okay. Uh, yes, so obviously, yes, so I didn't define it, right? But uh, you have the two variables. Yes, because, uh, so let, let me write it out. Row 1 r r prime is going to be n times the sum over the spins dx2 dx n psi star r sigma x2 xn psi r prime sigma x2 to xn. So that's the definition of the first order reduced density matrix. And the difference here, it's an off diagonal one because I didn't set the r equal to r prime. If I set r equal to r prime, then it's just the density. Yeah? The on top wall, on top wall, on top wall. Yes, on top wall, yeah. Um, 
the, the if you have an electron at R, then there should be zero probability of finding another electron also at R. So, so yeah, so at the exchange level, right? But so this is for spin unpolarized. So exchange is only between electrons of like spin. So half the electrons, the whatever electron you're looking at, the other half don't care. So they don't avoid it. So you get minus half the density here, right? Which is why I drew it about that way, right? See, I drew I drew it so that it's a little less than half the density uh, at that point. And you can look up articles and things uh, about this stuff. Okay. With pictures of these holes and things like that. Oh, and in particular, online on my website, you can find this ABC of DFT. And there are pictures of the holes uh, in the second part of the book. Uh, it's full of uh, typos. Though. Okay. Uh, now, one thing. So, of course, I've gone over. Now, one thing is for, for a one electron system, so this is for one electron only. We have that uh, e, uh, let's see. So the whole is simply minus n of R prime. Right? It doesn't, uh, the whole must be exactly equal to minus the density for one electron so that uh, the Hartree and the exchange correlation cancel. Right? Uh, so that, that will make this guy kill that guy and get no electron electron repulsion. And this is sometimes called, this is a, a whole we say is static. Now this is a highly confusing term. It's nothing to do with time dependence. It means it does not move, it does not change with R. So usually, like in this system here, right, where I have 10 electrons, as I move X around the place, the hole will follow me. Uh, the electrons arrange themselves to sort of screen each other out. And so the, the hole follows me wherever I go. For one electron, this is not true at all. The hole is totally static in the sense that it remains exactly the same. It's minus all the density, no matter where I am. And so that's very different from a, a system with many, many electrons in it. Uh, so, uh, so that's one way to think about it the sort of specialness of one electron and self-interaction. Uh, the holes are static. Okay, I'm still going to start at least uh, static correlation. About five minutes to the 45 minute mark. To the 45 minute mark, okay. Uh, let me see if I can do it in five minutes. Uh, so static correlation. I mean, here. So the paradigm of static, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll do the wave function piece. Uh, and I'll save the other piece for later if we get to it. So this, I'm not going to, so this is, uh, let's say, the prototype of static correlation. It's stretched. H2. Uh, so you're going to hear lots and lots about these kinds of examples. Uh, so but I'm going to tell you about something that happens with Hartree-Fock theory. And so we've known about it since about 1937, I think. Uh, so when we take a system, uh, so, so if you look at H2 at equilibrium, at the equilibrium bond length, the correlation energy is minus 42 milli arteries. It's exactly the same as helium. So it, as far as the electrons are concerned, it's like two electrons in a little Coulomb box. And the Coulomb box is a slightly different shape, but it's pretty much the same as helium. Uh, but when you stretch H2, weird, weird things happen. 
right? Um, and people knew about this from the early days uh, because they saw with Hartree Fock. So if you're doing, uh, so we'll have two protons, one at A and one at B, and a distance R of R. We take R to be much, much greater than one in atomic units, but finite. So that's what we mean by stretched. Uh, so if we far, say they're 10 angstroms apart, they're far enough away not to sort of care about each other energetically, but we'll see that their wave functions still care. Now, if you're doing uh, MO theory, like Hartree Fock or even Cohen Sham, uh, you have it's, two electrons are always in a sit spin singlet in the absence of a magnetic field, and so uh, your, your cone sham wave function or, or any non interacting wave function is a singlet times a doubly occupied molecular orbital, R and R prime. As you stretch them apart, the molecular orbital, the lowest one will be the bonding orbital, which is uh, an atomic orbital on A and an atomic orbital on B, right? Phi A and Phi B. And if you look in your chemistry book, your basic chemistry textbook, they'll give you the two orbitals when they do H2+, plus, the symmetric one and the anti-symmetric one. The anti-bonding anti one is higher in energy, this is the lowest energy one. We only need the lowest energy one because we're going to doubly occupy molecular orbital. But the trouble is, uh, when we look at this thing, if we evaluate the energy, excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, the second R in our prime. This, uh, this is our prime here. Uh, that should be R. Yeah. Thank you. If we evaluate the energy, right? Uh, what we're going to get is pieces uh, that are going to be, so uh, what you, let's write it out as one half, let's call it phi, I'm going to do this, I'll have my notation, I don't want to set up, I don't want to be writing here forever. Uh, yes, what we'll do phi a, Yes, these guys don't overlap when it's stretched, then we can uh, write it out this way. Now, these guys, right, have one electron on, oh, I don't know, right, 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 one electron on A and one electron on B, so this gives me, uh, this guy will be twice the energy of an H atom, and this guy is twice the energy H of a single H atom, but these guys, this is something called an ionic configuration, and it's two electrons on one atom, and the same for that guy. And those are not, those are not there in the real wave function, right? Uh, uh, so these are called ionic configurations. And what they mean is that the uh, they give they give a very wrong energy as you stretch the as you stretch the bond. So if you do what's called unrestricted Hartree Fock, uh, sorry, restricted Hartree Fock, if you plug 
plot out the binding energy curve. As a function of R, and here it's going to, this is the uh, separate H atoms. You set the zero to be twice EH. So if this is the exact curve, and you do a restricted Harvey fog calculation, it looks like this. It does not dissociate to the right fragments because you have a single molecular orbital that you doubly occupy. Uh, and because, because you're stuck when you doubly occupy that and you get the 50-50 mixture of A and B, you will get these terms where both are on A and none on B. And those are energetic, those are totally wrong, right? Uh, and this happens uh, just as much when you do an approximate cone channel calculation as uh, when you do approximate heart to fog. Now it's called restricted. It's restricted means spin restricted. We set the wave function to be a single in spin because it's a combination of up and down. If you do unrestricted, and I'll sort of finish on that point, an unrestricted calculation allows spin symmetry to break. You get exactly the same curve except at a crucial point you go over to the right answer. So, at least in the limit points, right? Unrestricted heart rate clock. And this is called the Coulson Fisher point. And this is a, a failure, let's say, a dramatic failure of heart rate clock. And in particular, you have this horrible choice uh, when R is too big. You can have the right spin symmetry for your Hartree-Fock wave function, but you have very bad energies. Or you can have the right energies. So in the, in the, when it breaks the spin symmetry, it puts the up electron on one on A and the down electron on B plus the 50-50 opposite mixture. And when you do that, if you localize one all on A and one on B, then you'll end up, when you do the combinations, there's no, there's no combinations where they're both on the same side. And it does go to the right answer. However, your wave function is no longer a spin eigenstate. So this is a horrible mess. And, and not only that, you know, people who do, say, molecular dynamics on your potential energy surface really don't like discovering the kink in the middle of it. So people who do, say, gas phase dynamics won't touch DFD for this kind of reason, because they need really certain potential energy surfaces to propagate their wave functions on. Um, and you have this point. On the other hand, right, you get good energies uh, doing the uh, unrestricted calculation. Now, if you do LDA, you'll get a more accurate curve. It will overbind. Uh, so I'll just finish with that. If I do LDA, I get the same, exact same kind of features. I'll overbind. I'll get to go out further, and, and then I'll have a Coulson Fisher point. Uh, so this would be LDA. Or GGA would look similar. Uh, the Coulson Fisher point is further out, which is helpful in some cases, but. Uh, uh, okay, so, so I haven't analyzed that uh, in any detail, but at least gives you the very basics of what uh, what goes wrong. And a dirty little secret of most DFT calculations when they compare with uh, a quantum chemical database, very often you look at a whole bunch of atomization energies. The G2 data set is mostly atomization energies of molecules. Mysteriously, you don't do your, take your DFT calculation with a molecule at equilibrium and stretch the bonds to make atoms because then you would go up here. What you actually do is you, you calculate the molecule at equilibrium where it's pretty good and then calculate the atoms separately and subtract them off. And then you get good energies. Um, so all DFT people cheat in this regard. 
But that's okay because all the weight function people were cheating in that regard for four decades before the DMT people started. Um, so this is the a central issue of electronic structure theory. It is part of the failures for strongly correlated systems. And everybody has stared at this for what, seven or eight decades now. Uh, and any time you try to use a single particle description uh, with an effective uh, one particle thing and an approximation, you run into this issue. And even though it might look like, oh, this is just H2, and it's just when you're stretching it, well, then try chromium, too, and, it, and, and, and it's a mess even at equilibrium. But also, you're doing molecular dynamics with something landing on a surface and bouncing off. Well, it's got to come and go, right? So you're going to hit these points. Uh, in the end, you always sort of run into this thing. OK. Right. Let me stop there. Yes. Can you say something about the medical relations and how it relates? Um, so, so, so these terms, sort of static correlation and dynamic correlation, sort of different people sort of define them different ways, right? In, in different communities. So there are little sort of vague, but I can give you a, a sense of it. I want to know what the dynamic relation is. Oh, yeah. Well, the dynamic correlation then is anything that isn't static correlation, right? Uh, that's, uh, so, so the traditional quantum chemistry way of thinking about it, in, in this case here, right, is that so, so what's happening as I stretch the bond is that the symmetric orbital, the bonding orbital, and the anti-bonding orbital, the gap between them is becoming very, very small, right? As I stretch this, uh, this difference is very small, and so uh, between the plus and the minus combination. So, sort of, in a sense, no good quantum chemist would just go with one Slater determinant under those circumstances, since the, this other one is coming very, very energetically close to me, then I should put in two Slater determinants. If I put in two Slater determinants, I get the exact wave function in the stretch limit. And this is uh, and, and so, so, uh, so as this, when the gap starts getting small, this, this is an example of static correlation. The correlation in the helium atom that you get where you don't have to worry about this effect, that's dynamic correlation. That's one loose way of talking about the difference. Other people associated with the electron-electron cusp, uh, and all these ways you can think about are sort of related, but they're all sort of slightly different. Another way to think about it is, if we take the hydrogen at equilibrium, I said that the correlation energy is minus 42 hartrees. And I also said earlier this morning that uh, EC plus TC is let this, but it's approximately equal to zero for weakly correlated systems. And we saw for helium, so this weak correlation is, is while well, the way it breaks down is, uh, for example, under strong static correlation. Uh, so, so these two numbers are almost equal and opposite in a weakly correlated system. And again, that would be dynamic correlation. When we get to this case where the gap gets really small, in fact, TC, will often become much smaller than the EC. So this is a way of thinking about these words static and dynamic. So, so normally EC equals TC plus UC. And this guy is normally about minus a half of that guy. And if you look at the numbers I gave you for helium this morning, you'll see that that's approximately true. That's sort of weakly correlated. Uh, for H in stretch, as, as, as R goes to infinity, uh, TC goes to zero. So that sort of fits with the idea that, that the correlation in stretched H2 is all potential correlation. It is very unusual to have no kinetic correlation going with it. So a sort of fairly 
precise way, choice of separating these two is to say that for normal dynamic correlation, TC is approximately equal to minus UC. When TC, the ratio of TC to UC goes to zero, that's a case of strong static correlation. Uh, but you would use the terms kinetic and potential rather than static and dynamic. Yes. Uh, and, um, when, yep. yes. when you call strong correlations, so what exactly do you mean? Strong <laughs> so, so, so it doesn't necessarily mean that, say, the correlation energy itself is particularly big. Uh, so, so I would say for the purposes here, this strong static correlation. It's the effect of localizing electrons uh, on different sites. So, so here for H2, it, I didn't have time to do it, and maybe I'll do it at the start of the next lecture. You have half an up electron and half a down electron on each <coughs> hydrogen atom. And because you have a fraction of an electron spin decomposed on each site, uh, that's a case of strong static correlation. Now, strong correlation, especially in condensed matter, can also mean uh, correlations that are sort of on a macroscopic level. Uh, so I would say localizing the electrons on sites and having to deal with that, that's one part. But then this effect sort of grows exponentially as you go from H2 to H10 and H100. Because you can get many different Coulson and Fisher points because you get many different combinations that can occur. So this is the case for just two sites, and then there's extra stuff that goes really horribly bad uh, when, when you start trying to go to the thermodynamic limit. But those are sort of correlations that are missed by a sort of approximate one electron picture, uh, and sort of it fails worse and worse. And so, for example, a Mott Hubbard insulator is a strongly correlated system in that sense. Uh, but it's, it's both features, yeah. Question on that side? Yeah. Um, does this problem sort of crop up in, in normal uh, solid stage in the periodic systems? Uh, yeah, well, yes. Again, I mean, you'll uh, run into these things if you take a lattice and stretch it. To within experimentally realizable. Uh, not so much, right? So, so uh, typically under earthly pressures, right? Uh, you want so this Coulson and Fisher point here is two or three times the bond length. So that doesn't happen a lot, right? On the other hand, if you're doing uh, sort of well, as I say, if you're doing dynamics and things are coming and going, then you're passing through those points. He said that uh, using Moody reference when talking about where yes. method, uh, methods uh, can cure this. Yes, so absolutely. Right. Does DFT have the counterpart for Moody reference? That, uh, that we do it? Uh, people certainly do it. Uh, a lot of people do things with. So, so I mean, in some sense, in, in traditional DFT, it's sort of hardwired that you have this. this definition of the cone sham system, which as I said, so so even here, right, even in our stretched H2, the exact cone sham wave function is a singlet and it's a doubly occupied molecular orbital, right? It's very hard to see. So so people all the time, especially in chemistry, are sort of creating a sort of DFT version where the reference wave function is somehow multi-reference. The problem is always that you get away from a first principle description because you have to say which two I'm going to include. So you sort of put something in of your of your own. So it's very hard. The the thing that does work is this thing that Andreas Svin did about 20 years ago, and now lots of people use, where they do this range separation and they treat part of the problem as a wave function problem and part as a DFT problem, and all that is formally correct. Uh, so there, you sort of separate out the interactions, and then and then you separate them that way, and it's all formally exact. And then 
we all met to fix records for those things, uh, doing approximations. No, no, he and uh, has very good approximations to that. So that formalism is 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 fine, right? Uh, but it isn't really the multi-reference formalism that most people in quantum chemistry would like to be able to deal with these problems. Okay, so final quick question. Yeah, you have. I'm just thinking about how these cups follow the molecular demand. So if you got silver cups, you currently have problem with forces, right? Yes. Uh, but then it teaches fast. That's the point, then you can calculate it again. Or it's uh, well, well, actually, it's not smooth. Right? It's, uh, yeah, it's not smooth. So, so I, I, I mentioned gas phase dynamics, right? So people who do scattering of small molecules of things, of each other and stuff, they can't understand this, right? It's way too inaccurate for anything that they want to do, and they never uh, use DFD. If you're doing molecular dynamics in the condensed phase, right, you don't even notice, right? You just go right past these things, yes. But, but they are in there, right? And sort of the hope is that nothing terrible is happening. And actually, you don't use potential in its form. You just cover it point to the so you, you won't even notice that you're passing this point. Right? Yes. Maybe, maybe I can add something on yeah. this. If you calculate a curve like this, you will discover the Coulson Fisher point the hard way, even if you've never heard of it, because it tends to be very numerically unstable because there are competing configurations there. So you can get ridiculous forces all of a sudden, and very bad things can happen. And Unless you're aware of it, you don't even know why. Yeah. But well, that it's typically like three times the point, right? Yes. So typically do not access in the in the end. You make you call the whole dissociation. Well, hold, hold on. I mean, what, like when you do MD with cone sham, right? Mm -hmm. The reason you're not doing classical force fields is you want to watch reactions happen. Yeah. Which means this this is yeah. in there. This is in there, right? Because uh, something, some bond was broken, and something took off, right? So it went through the Coulson Fisher point. But no, most people who run MD simulations in condensed phase certainly don't want to look that closely. Right? Um, but it's in there. Uh, all right. So I think we will stop here. First of all, let's thank you, Omega.